Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 5.51, a couple minutes late. And we will begin our program at 6 o'clock. Topic of the program, the Saddle Mountains. I'm so glad you could join us this evening. It's a warm one. Probably uh, 85 degrees right now. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Hi, John. We're all kind of checking in. We're all kind of uh, making sure that we're, we're doing okay with our streaming here. Yeah, once we get to the top, hello, Brian. Once we get to the top of the hour, I'll tell my story about whether we were gonna do a field trip tonight or not. I guess we're not. But uh, not for lack of trying. So I'll, I'll tell you that yarn in a bit. I trust all is uh, well in your world. It is a summery evening here for sure. Hello, Jean. Let's look at the schedule for as is our, you know, we have some staples here. One staple is always looking ahead uh, or backwards, I guess. So this is the week that was. We had Susan Kaspari on a very windy evening here talking about ice cores. Last night we did our first field trip to Frenchman Cooley. Tonight we're back in the backyard for a talk of Saddle Mountains. I will not see you tomorrow night, Friday night as is our routine. Saturday morning, George Otis Smith. Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time, the Pacific Northwest Tectonics. It's been a busy week for me. I haven't even started on the George Otis Smith talk, and I know that much about him, so we'll see. We'll see what I can scrape together. I've been, I've been kind of last minute anyway, been kind of freelancing anyway for these, but uh, that will be a particular uh, all-nighter type of a thing. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I got a thank you that I need to share with you tonight. I'm hesitating one more time, though, just to make sure. I won't ask again, but can I ask you, are we doing okay? Audio, visual, got the cardboard box around the phone. We don't have the wind like we had last night. Many of you have sent me tips on how to solve that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, how to solve that. Uh, I mean, it was almost calm last night, and yet we had that wind sound uh, on occasion, so... Thank you for all the help. I'll, uh, I'll figure something out before our next trip. Tonight, there shouldn't be any problem at all. There's barely any wind anyway. And then I've got, just, just to really make sure, got your, you guys are in your uh, cardboard box. Okay, uh, thank you. So the UPS gal came in her brown truck. Is that UPS? It's UPS, isn't it? Uh, and had this box. And she said, you better, you better get this in the fridge now, perishable and fragile. 
And I'm like, well, thanks very much. I'll do that. And uh, so I open it up. There's a dry ice thing in there and the whole deal. And so, here's the box from Bake Me a Wish. It says New York. I don't know if it's from New York. Can you guess what it is? They have been thawing for about two hours. Still not sure what they are. I don't think I would have known what they are until I read the card and the description. So these are officially chocolate truffle lava cakes. Four of them. And here's the card. For Mr. and Mrs. Zentner, thank you for the great geology YouTube presentations in the backyard. Here is a lava cake, as in the fifth type of lava, you gotta love it. We are all learning, we are all learning more about our planet along with you. So that's from Keith in the Longview Kelso area. And Keith, I want to thank you for your generosity. And uh, I've got directions here on what to do with this. Uh, thaw for two hours at room temperature, check. Serve warm. Uh, plate and heat the thawed product in a microwave on high for 30 seconds. Accompany with whipped cream, berries, and or your favorite sauce. Okay, well, I don't think we're doing that, but we'll do our program tonight. I'll sign off, and then if you want to stick around, instead of taking a walk like we did last night out at Frenchman, um, we'll... Uh, We'll have a little lava show. I think I, I think I know what it might be like, but maybe maybe you do. I don't. I've never had a lava, lava cake. Chocolate truffle lava cake. So thank you, Keith. That'll be fun. We'll enjoy these virtually uh, after the talk tonight. All right, I got one minute. I guess you should see the board here. See, I'm not foxing the oak tree. That's, come on, I wasn't born yesterday. Come on, English oak, is that all you got? Oh, come on, man, I just, I just, I just embarrassed you right now. I got the chalkboard in a different spot. I'll get you down low. I'll post you up. Have my way with you. Come on now. I am talking to the oak tree right now. That'll do. Give me a minute, would you? I need to think. Thanks for joining us tonight.
Well, a pleasant good evening to you all. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to my backyard. This is another geology live stream. Backyard geology. I don't know, maybe that's what I should have called this series. Um, I'm so glad you're with us. We're talking tonight about a place called the Saddle Mountains, and maybe there's other Saddle Mountainses. If you Google Saddle Mountains, maybe you end up in Arizona or California or uh, Uzbekistan. I don't know. But we've got our own Saddle Mountains here in central Washington. And um, it's one of my favorite places for a number of reasons. And I hope before we're done to show you the incredible variety of very interesting geology in a very small area. Plus, it's rural. Plus, it's got a bunch of beautiful sage plus there's high and lows, plus there's water, plus there's history, human history. There's lots going on. And you know, I think by now, that I've, I've been leading field trips over the years. I think we started, Carl Loquist and I from the college, we started doing these public trips for free, these public field trips. We choose Sunday. We've doing, been doing these Sunday field trips, four of them every year, I think since uh, 2007. That's a long time, I guess. And uh, there's almost an inside joke now. I keep going back to the Saddle Mountains for a different reason. It's like, oh my God, this guy doesn't know anything new. Well, actually, we keep learning new things. I keep learning new things. I keep sharing the new things. But we keep going back to the same general place. And so this one was easy to put together. I literally just grabbed a few field guides that I've put together over the past few years, reviewed them quickly, and I'm ready to roll with you. So... Uh, particularly loose tonight and hope you enjoy it. And if you know the area and you've always wanted to ask a question or two about things near Othello or Beverly or Mattawa, these are dinky little towns, Corfu, Smyrna, right? Uh, only a few of us know these places and we have viewers from around the world and I'm unconscious of you watching from places that are distant from us. Uh, but I'm hoping to impress upon you some interesting geology in a, in a small area. To start with, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to go back to last night. Last night was our first field trip that we tried, and it worked pretty well, I'd say. And uh, we were here, Frenchman Cooley, up here. So this is the Columbia River. This is the Columbia River coming down through central Washington. Here's where you're looking right now in Ellensburg. So to get to Frenchman Cooley last night, I drove 30 minutes to Vantage, crossed the bridge, went up and over the Frenchman Hills, and dropped into Frenchman Cooley right here. We were very close to the Columbia River, Frenchman Cooley. And I, there was so much to kind of uh, deal with last night with papers flying and wind and all sorts of things. You know, it was my first time doing that 100% from the field. Uh, I want to just do a couple final thoughts from Frenchmen, and then I'll tell you why I'm starting with Frenchmen tonight. So we were here, and I wanted to show you this last night, and I forgot that I had it. It was buried in the bottom of my pack. So the little walk that I did with you last night, and if you weren't with us, you can watch the replay, live stream number 52, Frenchman Cooley. Uh, I started broadcasting from here, and then we walked... When I had the, the camera going, and we worked our way up to the Red Star, and we were looking down into Echo Cooley. I call it Echo Cooley. Technically, it's Echo Basin. And uh, we only got a glimpse of the true Frenchman Cooley, but I, I think many of the viewers uh, got a decent sense of that walk, at least. And I also show you this because this is the only parking lot that's got a couple of pit toilets in it, so it's an easy little parking lot to find. And, and up you go. You should be able to find that pretty easily. Hell, the two gals from Idaho did last night, and they, are, I assume, are just driving through. The other little uh, um, loose change from last night is I never got around to this. So I was pleased with much last night at Frenchman Cooley. The one thing that was a slight downer, just a slight downer, was we never got a good look at those crinkle-cut French fries with good light. And some of you I noticed this morning actually went on to Bruce Bjornstad's YouTube channel, uh, Ice, Age Flood, Ice Age Floodscapes, I guess it's called. And he's got a drone video, about five minutes long maybe, with some nice music, and he's flying around, and you can see the, the crinkle-cut french fries well. But I, I set up a question last night, and I never answered it. 
The question was, why would we have parts of the Rosa flow that don't have columns? And the answer is, it depends on where we were. When I was actually chipping around and trying to find some good finicris and we had that real platy stuff, I was in the entablature, which is a very poorly understood part of these cooling basalt lava flows. The columns, we have some basic ideas growing from the bottom up and there's a whole live stream on columnar basalt. But I just wanted to show you this visual and let you know that we started our hike at Agatha Tower. We were in some columns and we quickly got into some entablature we were hiking around up in the entablature. We weren't, we weren't way up here. This part was actually gone, Frenchman Cooley. And then we uh, ended the hike back down with the columns. There, I feel better. Okay, so that was last night. Now, we did he see some views looking south, do you remember, last night, to the Frenchman Hills. And the Frenchman Hills had a very graceful, loose cover to them. And that is one ridge that's a whole part of a whole family of ridges this evening. The ridges are called the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. He goes to the whiteboard. It's third person Thursday. Nick Zetner goes to the whiteboard and Nick Zetner lifts the whiteboard into the frame like a boss. So look at the laundry list of things that we want to talk about. I could spend an hour on each of these topics, but my point is all of this stuff is available to enjoy at Saddle Mountains. So I'm just briefly introducing right now the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. The Saddle Mountains Fault is next. Then the, something called the Ringgold Formation, which is a favorite topic of mine recently. I never used to care about the Ringgold. Uh, Cougar Point Tough. Old Columbia River, and something called ice caves, which sound intoxicating. And I include it tonight because people always ask about the ice caves over at Saddle Mountains. And I've got a little bit of inside scoop for you. I don't think I did outfox the English Oak. <laughs> Whatever. You know what, you're coming, you're coming with me. Thanks. Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. So, the Frenchman Hills, the Saddle Mountains. Manashtash Ridge, Umtanum Ridge, Yakima Ridge, Rattlesnake Hills, over to Autanum Ridge. There's a story here for these ridges. And in a way, this Saddle Mountains episode is a, um, a summary live stream because we've discussed thrust faults, we've discussed super volcanoes, we've discussed old river systems. We've been at this a while and yet the Saddle Mountains, we can put it all together. So let me ask you, are you aware why we have this family of basaltic ridges? And oftentimes if you get to the top of those basaltic ridges, you actually can see loose, graceful piles of loose. I'll give you a hint. Each of these basaltic ridges are layers of basalt lava that then started to get squeezed and each basaltic ridge started to form into a ridge. So in other words, the ridges were not always there. Do you know why? What am I gonna go grab in the grass right now? Correctamundo. This famine, and I'm only showing you some of the ridges, there's dozens more, but collectively this Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt is a direct result of this. Many of you have seen it many times. Here are the, the folds and the faults in central Washington. Saddle Mountains would be right here, one of these guys. And to get this squeezing, to get these flat layers to actually knuckle up, this is Geology 101 now. We take Northern California and we rotate it north 
and Northern California pushes into Western Oregon, Western Oregon pushes into Western Washington, and there's a big stop sign up here in British Columbia, and they're not playing our rotation game. And as a result, we're doing a lot of squeezing, a lot of compression of the bedrock layers in central Washington, and we now have GPS receivers to document that, okay? Now, that's Geology 101, that we just take these layers and arch them up in the Saddle Mountains or Boylston. So the Saddle Mountains continue into my county, Kittitas County, and become the Boylston Mountains. And then they kind of wimp out as they approach town. Badger Pocket is up in there. Okay. Well, Geology 201, I guess, is it's not just a simple knuckling up. Each of these ridges is a knuckling up, but also a sliding north. I'm blinded now. I think, I, I think I'm in the frame. So here's our flat layers of basalt. We start the clockwise rotation. We start squeezing these layers. We start knuckling them. But notice that my knuckle is going to start creeping north. Like it's almost like these are um, caterpillars that are all facing the cascades and they're all inching their way sideways. That's a dumb analogy. Forget I even said that. It's like these are gummy worms. Also equally dumb, but let's do it anyway. We've got all these worms. Each of them is a basaltic ridge. It's a big knuckle that's a thousand feet high, by the way. They're not little hills. It's a thousand feet to the top of each of these guys from their base. Many of the locals here in Ellensburg walk to the top of Menashtash Ridge. It's a good workout. A few thousand feet up, a few thousand feet down. 1,000 feet up, 1,000 feet down, excuse me. But what I was trying to show you there is that not only are these things lifting, so in other words, the knuckles, I'm showing you knuckles that are kind of coming up at you. Can you see my knuckle is actually coming at you? But in, a in addition to coming up, it's also being pushed north. So here it is in cross section. Knuckle up, but pushed north. What I'm trying to get at is that there's a big fault. There's a big thrust fault. Knuckle up, but then have big earthquakes. And each time I lurch my, my fingers north, I'm going on this thrust fault. I like this. Nick Zettner on Third Person Thursday likes this. He's never done this before. Nick Zettner is thoroughly impressed with himself at the moment because you can even see a shadow. So the thrust fault plane, the, the plane of the actual fault is relatively flat. It's not a steep fault. It's a flat fault. Oh, he really likes this. I'm screaming now into the phone. But as we continue to squeeze, yeah, we're still knuckling all right. But the point is we have major earthquakes on these faults. And you're like, oh, God, really? Oh, wait, in eastern Washington? Is there, wait, is there going to be a tsunami? No. There's no ocean water here. We're in the desert. We'll be in the cozy fort for five minutes tonight, not much. I want to show you a video I've already shown you. But I want to show it again after we do this stuff nice and fresh. There's some good visuals to, to help us. We do have evidence of big earthquakes in eastern Washington. And you're like, where? I just made a fat, heavy black line. That's not a gummy worm. That's a fault. That's the Saddle Mountains Thrust Fault. The Saddle Mountains Thrust Fault. And one of the reasons that I'm showing you the video tonight is you've got a few drone shots from Chris Smart, who I work with to make those PBS installments. And he's got a, a, a few killer shots, drone shots that are wonderful. And if you haven't been over here before, I can't get out of my own shadow tonight. This is an incredible change topographically here. Those that have, you, you can go to Mattawa, a little town of Mattawa. You can drive up some dusty roads. You can get to the top, mostly to look for petrified wood. There's, it's like a war zone up there. They've really been finding a lot of petrified wood 
in the bedrock layers on top of Saddle Mountains. But those that have been up there know that you're looking straight down a thousand feet. And I, I, I can only show you in the cozy fort what it looks like, but what I wanted to do, after I was done with the field trip last night, uh, some friends joined me and we were kept our distance, but they had some uh, refreshments and we enjoyed ourselves and watched the sunset at Frenchman Cooley. And then we said our, our goodbyes and I said, hey, you know what? I wonder if I can live stream from the Saddle Mountains tomorrow night. This is last night. And it's starting to get dark. But I just kept looking at my phone and checking the bars, you know, because we had three bars and then two bars, three bars and two bars. I have Verizon, pretty good generally. And so we had enough bars. We had mostly three bars last night. So I thought, okay, I need three bars to really successfully stream without major buffering. So it's, it's four bars advantage, man. I'm feeling great. And then I, I cross, I get down toward, this is Sentinel Gap. This is where the Columbia River is going right through the Saddle Mountains. And we're down to two bars. And then we actually get to this private property that has this wonderful uh, thick ash that I'm going to show you in the video. And I actually texted. I didn't, I went, not when I was driving, I stopped. I stopped. I, I pushed off to the... Texted Jim, the owner of the pit, said, hey, I'm thinking about live streaming tomorrow night. He's like, you're kidding, really, from my spot? And I'm like, yeah. He said, hey, we watched the Bing Crosby thing, man. That was great. He said, go for it. So I drove up to the base of his pit, and there was one bar. So I'm like, that's it. Can't do it. I guess I'll do the backyard. So I was at the pit. I was at Crab Creek. I was at all these spots I thought I could do it, and I just didn't have the coverage. So we're here kind of by default. I really wanted to be out there with you tonight because it would have been a nice night to be there. But we'll do the best we can from here. Okay, so I need to pick up the pace. It's already 618. I say that all the time. But uh, all we're doing so far is talking about bedrock. We're talking about the fault. Let me show you the fault. Actually, this might give you a hint. So these are some of these field trip guides I've been using. Boy, really blind right now. So do you see how dramatic the Saddle Mountains are compared to the area to the north? I hope this image gives you a good sense of that. Yeah, I was, I was talking about Brett's on this trip. I wasn't even, I wasn't even there. Now this is, you know I'm a fan of the uh, old days. And so here's Vantage where we uh, crossed where I crossed yesterday to join you at Frenchman Cooley before 1927 a ferry and, and, and built in 1927 this old bridge that was a major uh, way to cross the Columbia in Brett's day back in the 1920s. He's off track. Nick Sentner's off track. That's true. The Saddle Mountains area was just, you know, just nothing there. Nothing. No roads or anything. You're just crossing everything on foot. Here's Beverly, which is a landmark for us. Beverly is, is right here. So Crab Creek is coming from Drumheller Channels, and Cra Crab Creek is working its way right along the base of the north face of Saddle Mountains. Okay, what else can Nick Setner find over here? Relax. It's a joke, okay? Third person Thursday. No, we're not ready for that yet. I'm just going to kind of give you a bunch of stuff to see, even though I'm kind of blinded here. Hopefully you, hopefully you can see these really well. So here's, you see every one of these black lines is a thrust fault. So my knuckling up the back of the whiteboard, that's the story for each of those black line segments. Skip the basalt. We know about the German chocolate cake. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. So one of my favorite things to do when I'm trying to kind of take complicated stuff and present it to the public on one of these field trips is I take a very complicated map and I uh, make some copies and then I break up my old uh, colored pencils and I start coloring it away to try to make to have it make a little bit more sense. And I know there's a lot to absorb, but what you're looking at, 
And all these field trip guides, by the way, if you're interested, I'm doing this quickly, but you can go to nickzentner.com, find the Ellensburg chapter place, and I've got all my field guides that you can see as PDFs. You can even print them out if you want. Um, so this is one of those, and I just want to show you the geometry of these layers. Are you able to see this? Our, our thrust vault is barely visible, but you can see this is kind of the knuckling that I'm talking about. It's not quite as obvious here as I, as I want. Here's a better one. Here's a better cross-section by Steve Rydell back in the 80s. Here's another one of these knuckles with the major thrust vault at the base. Okay, well, Lydia Steich is a newly hired, I keep saying new, she's probably been there three or four years by now, uh, but she replaced Ray Wells with the U.S. Geological Survey, and her first professional job with the USGS was to do a new published report on the Saddle Mountains Fault. And she showed up to do that work. Hang on just a second. Hang on, Patrick. And uh, she's a structural geologist. Thank you, Patrick. So she's a, she's a structural geologist. And so her job was to try to figure out more about earthquake history on the Saddle Mountains Fault. It's a major structure. I've made it way too fat now, but you get the idea. It's a big structure. And there's such a credible change between the hanging wall and the foot wall of the fault, meaning it's very, it, it's a, the, the north face of Saddle Mountains, especially at the good light, like probably right now, it's a dramatic landscape. And by dramatic, I mean it is a steep face and then it's very flat at the bottom where Crab Creek flows. And you don't get that major face if, unless something dramatic happened, like Ice Age flooding last night, or in this case, mostly major earthquakes on the Saddle Mountains Fault like probably pretty recent earthquakes. So Lydia showed up and didn't know the area very well, I assume. And of course, the first thing you do is you start to learn the rock layers that are exposed on both sides of the fault. And she had some new techniques involving finding detrital zircons to get some new dates on some of those layers. And there's a lot in this. This is from Lydia's paper in uh, to 2017, so just, a, just three years ago. And all I want you to notice is that she's got different places going up the face of Saddle Mountains. She's got names for these stratigraphic sections like Schoolhouse and Smyrna. And so if you know those, those little locations uh, along Crab Creek, uh, below the north face of Saddle Mountains, you kind of have a sense of where she's going up. But, there's a bunch of non-basalt layers that she was uh, carefully studying and climbing up that face with her dogs. And she was finding layers. Now, am I close enough where you can see some numbers? She actually came up with some brand new dates that we didn't have before. Obviously, you see the 6.979 million years old. I'll tell you what, that, what that's about in a second. But can you read my other little red numbers here? Hopefully you can. Those are, those are layers that we've always known about, but we never had a way to get an absolute age on them. And she, she now has given us some very precious uh, new dates. Okay, well, what's the main story? The main story is because of the kinds of rocks that she's seeing in these sections, mostly the brown stuff, which are basaltic conglomerates, meaning that there's a bunch of uh, German chocolate cake pieces that are falling into these areas. Her interpretation, and it's a pretty straightforward one, is that before 6.79 million years ago, Saddle Mountains was just a knuckle. 
So we start making saddle mountains when we start squeezing these guys, going back even 12 million years ago, we start to knuckle up. Do I go to this again? Yes. So let's pick a number. 12 million years ago, we've got our layers flat. Saddle Mountains does, is not there. The ridge is not there, it's flat. Flat, 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 okay? And then we start squeezing Northern California to Canada. We start arcing, we start knuckling up. I have my whole arm now, I'm just, I just need to do my hand. But from the details that Lydia was able to figure out, we went from a knuckle to an actual fault. In other words, instead of just folding, we started to actually break the ground with our first earthquake 6.79 million years ago. Muffler boy. And then we continue making earthquakes. Here's the magic answer. How often do we have big earthquakes on the Saddle Mountains Fault? Is it a thousand years of stress being pumped into these rocks before we jump again? Is it 5,000 years between big earthquakes? Is it 500 years? We don't know. We're just getting started. But Lydia's work helped us realize that we really didn't have a fault making earthquakes until 6.79. And because there's so much growth of the Saddle Mountain Ridge in the last 6.79 million years ago, we know that this is still an active area. And I don't want you to lose sleep over it, kids, but I do want you to be aware that it's an exciting place to study geology because there's a lot of very fresh, exciting deposits located there. We keep it moving. What else is on our list? I'm gonna do this very quickly. I already scrubbed this off. That says Ringgold Formation. The Ringgold Formation and the Cougar Point Tuff. So, I've been around a while. I get asked a lot of questions, email, in person, after public talks, whatever. It's great, big part of my job, I enjoy it. I keep a little tally kind of in my head of how often people ask about certain things. And if they ask, a lot. And I go, you know what, I should actually make a program on that somehow. So one question I almost always get when people bring up the Saddle Mountains is, I can almost finish their sentence. They're like, yeah, we were uh, out chucker hunting and uh, we were there along Crab Creek, you know where I am? Oh yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, east of Beverly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, it's usually in the shade, but we were looking up at that face of Saddle Mountains and we could actually see a couple of like, what are they, like sandstone layers up at the top? Like, what are those layers? And for a long time, I'd say, well, I don't, I've never been up there. It's tough, tough to get up there. They go, oh, yeah, I don't know how you get up there. Well, we now have a drone, so I've actually got good video. It's short, but it, good video. And Lydia scrambled down from the top, down to those two tan layers, and carefully measured them, analyzed them, got ages from them. And so I'm here to tell you right now what those two layers are. I'm not saying Lydia discovered what the layers were, but she got new information that really helps us snap it into focus. Close to the top of the Saddle Mountains, there's two tan layers, depending on the light. Sometimes they look white. The lower of the two is called the Cougar Point Tuff, and that's ash that fell out of the sky from a supervolcano explosion in southern Idaho. 11.81 million years ago. Now, if you're really on top of your game, I just told you the date for when we started to lift the ridge. The, the ridge had just begun to grow, remember? 12 is when we started. So we began the knuckling 12 and shortly after that, here comes 30 feet of ash falling out of the sky from the Bruno Jarbridge Caldera. Bruno Jarbidge Caldera. I get a lot of comments. Actually, it's Jarbidge. Actually, it's not Jarbridge. Actually, I live in Idaho. It's Jarbidge. Thank you. 
we got 30 feet of ash falling out of the sky and landing on a saddle mountain that's just not there. It's just starting to knuckle. But that 30 feet of volcanic ash is still there. It's just a thousand feet higher than it was before. In case it hasn't dawned on you, the Columbia River is older than the Saddle Mountains. The Columbia River goes right through these two ridges with no problem at all. And that's because the Saddle Mountains and the Frenchman Hills were not there. The Columbia River was doing its thing, getting itself established, and then we start the knuckling up. The river's older than the ridges. Now in the case of Umtanum Ridge, I'm not sure what the story is there, because you'll notice that the Columbia River takes a pretty hard left pretty hard turn to the east and the Umptanum Ridge is, is a big one and it's right there. So maybe there's a little, er, I, I'm just, I'm spitballing now. Nick Zentner is spitballing on Third Person Thursday. Maybe the Umptanum Ridge actually is a little bit older and got established enough to detour the river at a certain point. It feels like I'm all over the place. I kind of am, but I feel like if you have watched most of these programs from the backyard, we've covered most of this. I don't feel like I need to start from scratch with each of these things. And so some of you feel like I go too slow sometimes anyway. So this is kind of a, um, assuming you have a few basics, and if you don't, you might go back and watch a couple of these programs. So what are the two tan layers towards the top of the Saddle Mountains, which you'll see in the Cozy Fort in just a few minutes? The lower of the two tan is what? Ash that fell out of the sky from the Juno, from the Bruno Jarbage caldera near Twin Falls, Idaho. Amazing. At the same time, ash was falling out of the sky in Nebraska, buried a bunch of rhinos at Ash Fall State Park, northern Nebraska. Major stories. What's the other white to tan layer that's really truly at the top of the Saddle Mountains? Say the folks that ask that all the time. I can be a, a jerk now and just go, yeah, watch the five minute program. You'll, you'll, you'll get your answer. No, that's not what I do. That top tan layer is called the Ringgold Formation. And the Ringgold Formation to me was just a bunch of boring lake beds until a couple years ago, until guess who? Lydia Steich showed up and started carefully studying the sand that's in the Ringgold Formation. Let me show you, let me show you something. Yeah, this is pretty good. This is a field trip I did in, I don't know, uh, a couple of years before Lydia showed up. So I was just learning some basics. Here's a little stratigraphic column. Okay, you can see that okay? So the purple, oh yeah, forgot. Okay, so the 30 feet of ash is the green. I didn't know about the Cougar Point Tough at the time. I just, I just knew it was from Idaho, so I called it Idaho Tough. Guess what the purple is? The Elephant Mountain Flow, the one that has the Tootsie Rolls in it. That thing showed up before Saddle Mountain started to grow. So close to the top of Saddle Mountains, there's the, my favorite Elephant Mountain Lava that has some Tootsie Roll columns. Snipes Cobbles, those red dots are old Columbia River quartzites. So if you happen to see the Ancient Rivers YouTube lecture I did a few years ago, I opened the program talking about bouncing up to the top of Saddle Mountains with some petrified wood hunters. And they got out of the truck and said, how come there's a bunch of river rocks up here close to the top of Saddle Mountains? I'm like, I, hell of I know. Well, I now know that the Columbia River uh, flowed like this for a time before it got over here and then the ridge started to grow. But the point is, do I have the Ringgold on it? Yes, I do. TRU is the Ringgold formation. TRU is the Ringgold. So why would you want to care about the Ringgold? 
Well, the ring gold is a widespread series of tan layers. It's not just at the top. Oh, I forgot I had these. Great. Here you go. This is from Google Earth. This is not a drone. This is me zooming around on my desktop computer. And these are the layers we're talking about. What did I label here? Yeah, I'm showing you the, the ring gold and the Elephant Mountain, the Tootsie Rolls up high. But do you notice how dramatic the landscape is, how big the change is from the top to the bottom? You can't do that unless you do some rather significant earthquake activity. I got another one. Yeah. This place called Smyrna Bench, that's where ring gold is found. And then there's our uh, Elephant Mountain as a marker bed down below. I just made up the names of the scallops so everybody could kind of look at it together when we were out in the field. Forgot I had that. But those that are in, that know Central Washington well, I am sweating, man. The ring gold is most famously on display near Hanford across the Columbia River from Hanford, where we have what's known as the White Bluffs. That's mostly the Ringgold Formation. And if you're waiting for it, the Ringgold is a series of mostly lake beds between eight and three million years old. And I wasn't interested until recently because I thought it was just a lake story. Who gives a damn about a lake story? But then Lydia's work and Bruce Bjornstad's work helped me see that there's some exciting sand in the ring gold and cobbles in the ring gold. It's not just a boring lake story, it's quite often a river story. And the, the mind blower, so here's a strat column I made talking about the ring gold from bottom to top. There's almost a thousand feet of ring gold and it's not all lake stuff, as you can see, going from bottom to top. Yeah, there's a bunch of clay and silt, but there's major conglomerate sections right at the, the profile of the Columbia River. There's a, an incredible fossil layer with a bunch of um, critters. I'll leave it at that because I don't know much about fossils. What's our timing here? I forget what age we were even talking about. Well, here's our 6.97 million year horizon when the Saddle Mountain Fault starts to break the surface. Oh, I forget the fossils, sorry. Uh, Dave Green helped me learn about those jaws of all sorts of interesting things. I should remember more, I don't. But the point is, there's rivers bringing sand to the ring gold. And this is a developing story because the sun is behind the cloud right now, mercifully for the moment. And Lydia is trying to make sense of why she has some river sand from southern Idaho in central Washington. Because the traditional story is Hell's Canyon doesn't exist until three million years ago. And she's got southern Idaho sand at Saddle Mountains, right above Taunton, the old train station going back seven million years old, and nobody can figure out how that Idaho sand got to central Washington. Like, was it the snake? If it was, did the snake go through Hell's Canyon? I didn't think the Hell's Canyon started till three million years ago. So how can we have that Idaho sand coming? Well, Lydia, are you sure that's Idaho sand? She's got all sorts of data. So it's an ongoing, really exciting place. And what ties it all together? One particular location called, you guessed it, the Saddle Mountains. But wait, there's more. I mentioned briefly that the Columbia River used to cross this area before the Saddle Mountains were knuckling up. That's true. That explains why there's Snipes Mountain conglomerate. That's why that explains there's white quartzite uh, river cobbles at the top of Saddle Mountains today. Those river cobbles just took a ride up the Knuckling Ridge. That's cool. But there is an Ice Age flood story here as well. Can you believe it? I mean, the list, I, I, this is even a conservative list. I could have added uh, five more things easily. 
Hi. Can you see somebody back there? Are you going to say hi? I just did. All right. That's my wife. Things are opening up, apparently. Are we having visitors in the backyard? Why would we be having visitors during a live stream of a thousand people? Nick Sentner wonders that. Nick Sentner will not think about it anymore because he's talking to you. If you recall, now we're jumping to less than 20,000 years ago, very, very recent activity. The most recent ice advance, we had the Okanagan lobe in place, and do you recall that the Columbia River for a time was routed through Grand Coulee? And the Columbia River in between Missoula floods went over Dry Falls? And the Columbia River, during the time that the Okanagan lobe was in place, wait for it, the Columbia River can't do its normal thing. The Columbia River is, is sent through the Grand Coulee. The Columbia River, through Drumheller channels, the Columbia River flows right along the bottom of Saddle Mountains. So on our chalkboard, I know I have the Columbia River here today, but I'm saying during much of the Ice Age, this area was dry. I never even thought about that till right now. Uh, sorry, this, this is still there. But this advantage, there was no river. When the Okanagan lobe up in the sky, when the Okanagan lobe was in place, there was no river at Chelan. There was no river at Wenatchee. There was no river advantages. Instead, can you see this? Between Ice Age floods, the Columbia River came through Drumheller channels. The Columbia River, just for a short time during the Ice Age, flowed right where Crab Creek is today. And during the Ice Age, when the Okanagan Lobe is in place, and we don't have regular river stuff, we have a big batch of water, a Missoula flood event, and the Missoula flood water. This is Brett's walking around with his students in Drumheller Channels, remember? The woman and her kids, the peeping Tom, and the Missoula flood is coming and actually carving a couple of little subtle coolies that you might know downstream, muffler boy. Okay, it's quarter to seven. Uh, I want to read an email to you, and then I wanna go in the cozy fort with you just a second. Now, a lot of people ask about those two tan layers in the top of Saddle Mountains, for sure. But there's maybe more people usually older people, that hear about this place at the base of Saddle Mountains, where in the olden days, they would store meat through the summer in ice caves. And who's they? Usually people that work for the railroad. The Milwaukee Road is a railway that was put in in the 1900s early, the first decade of the 1900s, I think. It was all in place by 1910. There's railroad buffs that'll correct me here, but I think I just Googled that before we came out here. And when they were working on that rail, they discovered that the major talus fields, you know what talus is or scree? You know, if, if, this, if, this, if this is the, the actual, if the chalkboard now is the face, the north face of Saddle Mountains, it's a steep face Gravity's working on that thing. There's occasional, uh, regular sloughs of rock, loose rock coming down this face and making huge aprons, piles of just angular blocks of rock. If you, if you know this country at all, you know what I'm talking about. Scree slopes, talus slopes, etc. 
Well, if you're at the base of Saddle Mountains, you have this uh, ridge that's a thousand feet high, you're not getting any sun at any time of the year directly hitting these talus slopes at the base of Saddle Mountains. And so apparently, and this is where my knowledge runs out, there's cold air that gets into those pores in the talus slope, the base of Saddle Mountains, and the, the, the air is so cold that even in the hottest days of summer, you can keep that beef or other things, ice cold beer, I guess, uh, refrigerated before there's even a whole lot of electricity in the country. This is 1909, 1912, 1915. So I always get asked, have I been to those? Do I know about those? Where were those? Where were they? Well, as you know, I've been getting uh, a blizzard of emails, and I'm appreciative of everybody taking the time to email me, but I'm having a hard time keeping up. But I did get two emails from Larry from Seattle. And so, Larry, I hope I'm not violating your trust. I'm not going to give your last name. Um, I want to read what Larry said in his two emails. And just because people keep asking about it. So here's Larry from Seattle, who was a former student of Dr. George Beck, by the way, at Central in 1956 and 1957. That alone is pretty cool. But Larry says, hey, Nick, uh, I got some Saddle Mountain history for you. When the railroad was built, Milwaukee Road, first decade of the 1900s, the workers installed a short drift into the base of the mountain to store food, meat, in 1957, when I was there last, <laughs> last time he was there was 1957, the only thing left was a wooden door set in the rock face. Oh, now wait a minute. Is Larry talking about the actual basalt or is he talking about the talus? I assume it's the talus. I opened the door and there was only about 20 feet of tunnel. I don't know the length, the original length of the drift as it had caved in. There was a small stream of water, less than two inches wide and approximately one inch deep, flowing out of the mountain. But what was really cool, pun intended, says Larry, was the skim of ice on the edges of the stream. Also, a cold draft coming out of the tunnel. Just a little fact from the past. And then I, I emailed Larry a couple days ago and I said, uh, I'm really interested. I get asked about that all the time. Would you be able to give me a hint on where that, where that was? So he replied a couple of days later. Uh, I'm going to try to give you directions, but this was 60 years ago. I went to Google Earth, but it drives me bonkers. So he says, you go from west, start driving east from Beverly. You go about five miles, you cross Crab Creek. From there to a waterway with a large rock fan on your right is approximately three plus miles. The railroad reefer, is that really what he meant? R-E-F-E-R, -E -E railroad reefer should be in that three mile space. Walk was flat from the road to the base of Saddle Mountains where the drift was dug. Almost to the top of the rock gully is a large petrified wood deposit. That was the reason for my visit. I'm trying to set up a trip to show my wife where I walked so long ago. Thanks a lot, Larry. So that's all I know. Thanks to Larry for his inside scoop. I have a general idea where he's talking, uh, but um, good stuff. Okay, it's 10 minutes to seven. Uh, let's do the cozy fort for five minutes. You'll get a sense. I'll keep my mouth shut, I think. I just wanna show you this episode that has visuals and detail that you're not getting from my glossed over version, and then we'll go to your live Q&A. So, give me a second, talk so much yourself. Hey! How's it going? What are we drinking? Uh, the expedition. Mmm, mmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have the Ellensburg head librarian over for wine. It's 
So what do we have left to do? We are looking at a five minute clip. We're doing about 10 minutes of Q and A. And then if you are still interested, we're going to cut into a lava cake. Cozy Fort by Steve. I can't find the crossbar. What I what I do with it? What in the hell? All right, we're going without a crossbar tonight. I think it's worth it. It's only five minutes, but I, I, do, I do think it's worth it. And I hope that you'll agree when you see it. This is an episode of Nick on the Rocks from PBS television. We filmed it last, last summer, I kind of forget. It was a hot day, I remember that. I was sweating then like I'm sweating now. Well, that's the end. Crack the mysteries of the Earth. Discover the energy that drives a planet. And explore the secret world below. With me, Nick on the Rock. my favorite places, the north face of Saddle Mountains. There's everything going on out here geologically, even though it's very remote. Missoula floodwater, the Ice Age floods came through this area. The Columbia River itself used to flow along the base of Saddle Mountains. The ridge itself is so steep because of an earthquake fault lifting the Saddle Mountains regularly on earthquakes, an active fault. But none of those are our topics right here. Today, we're climbing our way up all those brown rock layers, that's the basalt lava, and looking at the white stuff close to the top. Can you see it? What's that white stuff that's up on top? That's a lot of volcanic ash that fell out of the sky. But where did it come from? Which volcano is responsible for that layer? That's a great shot. This is a seismic risk story that continues. An earthquake every 10,000 years that lifts the ridge 10 feet each time a quake strikes. God dang, that's nice. There are clues here to a truly terrifying volcanic event from 11.8 million years ago. Tell me more. Look at this cliff face. It's so steep and it reveals much of our history. The rock layers are mostly basaltic lava flows stacked one on top of another. That's no surprise. The brown layers are found all through central Washington, from Dry Falls to the Gorge Amphitheater, from Hell's Canyon, all the way down to the Oregon coast. But what's with that white layer close to the top that's sandwiched between basalt lava flows? The white layer is volcanic ash, 30 feet of it. I repeat, 30 feet of volcanic ash that fell out of the sky. That's been a puzzle for a long time. Is this from the Cascades? This is where I wanted to live stream tonight. For a long time, nobody could figure it out. This is we Jim's now pit. know the chemical details of this volcanic ash. And there's a perfect match to a volcano 500 miles away in southern Idaho, not the Cascades. This is a super volcano story, not a cascade subduction story. Tell me more, Marshmallow Head. The super volcano produced an amazing amount of volcanic ash, more than 1,000 times the volume of the famous 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. Much of the American West showered in fine volcanic ash. It's 
So yes, it's true. The scale of these super volcano explosions is off the charts. But in this ash, we have tiny little details preserved from 11.8 million years ago. Raindrops falling through an ash cloud, the rain turning to hail, the hail getting coated in ash and being perfectly preserved as accretionary lapilli. Right here. Look at those details. These hailstones are gone, but the ash coating remains. Thousands and thousands of accretionary lapilli. The most recent supervolcano explosion on Earth was 70,000 years ago. What did that scene look like? What did it sound like? What did it smell like? We don't know the details because humans have never seen a supervolcano erupt. I think we probably packed too much into that show, uh, but it does go from the grand scale down to that very tiny hailstone scale, which is, I think, uh, a powerful thing to do. We, we, we work on all those scales uh, regularly, which is a kind of a fun part of this. Uh, fake May, uh, I expect a well thought out question from you. If you're a human being, I expect a good question now during this live question and answer portion. Looking forward to that from you. For the rest of you, I'm so glad you're with us. Go ahead and type in your live Q&A now, uh, your live questions, and I'll try my best to answer them for a few minutes, and then we'll have some cake together. How about that? Appreciate you sticking around this far. We got a thousand people. Good. Okay, I'm gonna pop out li my live chat like a boss. That's how I roll. Oh, top chat? Seriously? No way. Nick Zetner likes live chat on Third Person Thursday. Kurt, how do I look up the location of that ash wall you were in front of for your video? Um, thanks for the question, Kurt. Uh, that's private land, and I, I never got in there until a friend of a friend of a friend got me in, in touch with Jim. And Jim has been uh, very good about letting me in there, but you can understand it's private. And um, he purchased that land because it used to be a, a pit used to uh, haul that ash out of there and add to concrete. It's actually wonderful to, to make high quality cement, uh, but it hasn't been used in a long time. So. If you drive between Mattawa and Sentinel Gaff and you look off to your right, in other words, it depends. If you look east of that road, um, you'll see that wonderful uh, deposit. But I'm afraid uh, can't have you go up in there. You have to go through an orchard, that's private, and then Jim's place, that's also private. Sorry. Um, it's so cool, I wanted to share it, but uh, most of these other places are public and I'm happy to send people out there, but in this case, no. Eric, why is Badger Pocket called that? I don't know. Do you, uh, Creators of the Moon, seriously asking? Uh, you're, at, you're seriously asking, will I do a show on Creators of the Moon? That's an interesting thought, Eric. Um, it's been a run running joke on this live stream because people ask about it so often, and I was honestly saying, why do people keep asking about this place? I, you know, I've barely been out there. It was, it's been 35 years since I've been out there. I don't know, I could kind of, I could whip something up. Good idea. I'm not promising, but I'll, I'll think seriously about it. Thank you. Uh, most of the questions about why do they call it this, or Frenchman Cooley, what's the origin of the name? I just never take the time to, to, to look into that. Jack, can, can the one layer of ring gold that has fossils be attributed to the Bonneville flood? Way too old for that, Jack. Good thinking. And um, we're talking about three to four million years ago. If Dave Green sees this, he's going to be ticked because I... I, I I, I got a note, I saw some stuff, I forget how we got together, but basically 
met somebody through Facebook. That sounds kind of shady. And this guy lives in Wapato. He says, I used to collect incredible fossils, fragments of, of megafauna uh, in the White Bluffs before they converted it to a national monument. And I, I want to show you all this stuff I've collected. And it's, it's disarticulated stuff. There's not a complete skeleton. Uh, God, what did he have? Early horse and a jaw of a pig or something. <sighs> this is embarrassing. I don't but it's, it's millions of years old. Millions of years older than the Bonneville flood. Good thought, doesn't work time-wise. Nick, are the uh, new 289 asks, Nick, are a horse heaven hills between Prosser and Patterson, Washington, part of the lifting? Absolutely, John. So every one of, the, every one of these yellow lines uh, generally is the same age and generally is the knuckling, and they also are thrust faults. They're also Menashtash Ridge, horse heaven hills. They're all doing that thing earthquake-wise, muffler boy. But we're a long way from knowing the timing of that and knowing how severe our chances are uh, in, the, in the short term. Thurston, are the ice caves at Saddle Mountain similar to the ice caves in southern Idaho? Oh, um, I don't think so. I remember those. I, I was a graduate student in Pocatello at Idaho State back in the mid-1980s. And I remember driving out to the Snake River Plain and taking that little hokey tour of those, are they crystallized caves? Is that the name of it? Those are truly open caverns in the Snake River Plain basalt, and I forget the story of why those caves are there. Groundwater, I guess, but I don't No, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is a talus pile that just is protected from the sun. Similar to that crater glacier in the crater of Mount St. Helens being out of direct sunlight for its uh, year round. Shannon, is the ash at Saddle Mountains the same you see in Yakima Canyon? I wish. No. First of all, I wish there was that much ash. Uh, you can even follow that 30 feet of ash at Saddle Mountains and it goes down to just a few inches at Prosser and other places uh, up at the Weenass, for instance. Um, I was just texting with a guy today about the ash in, in Yakima Canyon. We still don't know which volcano that was. Um, but it's, it's almost certainly a few thousand years old as opposed to 11.8 million years. That's the crazy part of that. Uh, not only the volume, but the age of that super volcano ash. I'm glad you liked that. Evelyn, age seven, when Saddle Mountain moved on the fault, did the whole ridge break and move? How deep down did the break happen and how does that work? Well, You're a smart cookie, Evelyn. Um, so I'm back to my showing the thrust fault and the earthquakes when we do this kind of jumping. Did the whole ridge break? Uh, I probably not. I would I would think of the the ground breaking and slipping just maybe the the width of my fingers. Maybe it's just like that. Uh, is that true even? I don't even know. I mean, the, the thrust vault is a plane. I think we should think of the whole thing moving, Evelyn. Just five feet or something like that. That's the, for, our, for our purposes, that's, that's, that's the way we want to go. I haven't seen uh, can't remember, fake whatever. I'm still looking for him. Uh, automatic scroll. You got to love it. Timothy, uh, I missed some, but I'm now to uh, 6.58 p.m. Uh, is the small body of water below the mountain shown on the video a sag pond related to a fault? I'm not sure, Mazer. Um, there's some groundwater seeping in there. There's some irrigation water that's kind of artificially ponded in there, but I'm not really sure. You might not know that area better than I. Kevin, are the calcified rhizoliths part of the Ringgold Formation? That would have to be Lacustrin, right? Uh, Kevin, if I can't even pronounce the word rhizolith, that means I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about it. James, were those landslide deposits at the base of the scallops? 
Yes, um, thanks for the reminder. There are significant landslides. Of course, we've got a, we've got a steep, again, if this board is the steep north face of Saddle Mountains, there are significant landslides, small and large. The biggest is the Corfu landslide. If you Google Corfu, C-O-R-F-U, landslide, F-U. We're now over by Othello, Washington. That's a beauty. And I've been out looking at the Corfu landslide with earthquake geologists, and they say, well, obviously, there's a big earthquake uh, story here with the Saddle Mountains Fault, so there must have been an earthquake trigger to this major Corfu landslide. And then I've been out with Ice Age flood geologists, and they say, well, obviously, we have a huge amount of water coming through Drumheller channels, and those floods undercut uh, Saddle Mountains at Corfu and triggered the landslide with a major Missoula flood. And I go back and forth, but I, I think the position of the Corfu landslide is so dramatic and so clearly tied to where the high velocity water coming through Drumheller channels were that it makes sense that that's a Missoula flood story. But if you like landslides, North Face of Saddle Mountains, big and small, amazing. So the Saddle, Saddle Martins is a scarp. Yeah, it is. The Ringgold has, Arini, the, the Ringgold has been cut cleanly. So there's Ringgold uh, on the Royal Slope where the, all the orchards are around Royal City. And there's that same Ringgold on the Saddle Mountain side, uh, but they're offset. And so the scarp is between those. Sandy, is the hail part of the ash fall phenomenon big electric storms? Very difficult to say. The general discussion is a supervolcano, and if there's more on that deposit, and Hans Schmincke, who studied it first of all, and there's a couple of stories about Rheingold beer, et cetera. You can Google uh, supervolcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. That's a lecture I gave last year, I guess. It's, it's easily the most popular lecture I've ever put on YouTube. And, um, and the story there is that this supervolcano cloud that you saw in the animation is so dramatic that it creates its own weather. And the thought is that you're having storms, like rainstorms, going through kind of this frozen cloud. I don't know the physics of it. But you get the hail basically by raindrops turning to hail and getting coated with ash. So. Yeah, maybe big electrical storms. I think I now see what you're asking. What's the reddish layer above the 30 feet of ash? There's a good question, and that, that's where Chris got that drone stuff. You can never really see it well from the ground. But he got that drone up there at the right time of night, and he, that just popped. I was so pleased with that. I think I just started swearing a mile a minute in his office when he showed me that the first time, like out of excitement. That's a baked zone. So the next lava flow comes in, the Pomona lava. Imagine now you're 30 feet of ash sitting there. I don't know, 100,000 years, you're just sitting there. Now here comes a lava, the next lava from the next fissure. And this Hawaiian lava is flowing in making direct contact with this fragile styrofoam, basically. So you weld, bake, discolor the top of that Cougar Point Tuff. God, so cool. Gene says, microwave the cake. The lava is the hot chocolate that oozes out. That's coming, Gene. We do have a microwave. Humble brag. Shouldn't that ash layer be found elsewhere below the lava flow? Yes, Douglas, but the, the idea is that it wasn't, it wasn't technically 30 feet of ash that fell in one place. It was maybe a foot of ash that fell everywhere, and then there was reworking of the ash. Like, a, like in Wyoming, the snow lands, and that's just the beginning of the journey for those snowflakes. The wind is carrying it out and you know, sending it all over the Interstate 80 and everything else. You're asking about the ash, mainly because we looked at the video, understandable. Poslin, that's the word I couldn't remember, Colin, thanks. So there's a Actually, when I, before I got in touch with Jim, people kept saying, oh, if you've been up to the Poslin mine, I'd love to get up there. I heard it's private. I figured it was like a, a Poslin family. I didn't know the word Poslin. 
but now I realize it's a, it's a term about adding ash to a cement mixture. Even the Romans were doing it to create a certain curing whatever of, of cement. Uh, is there no panga station on top of Saddle Mountain Ridge? I'm sure there is, Michael. Does Crab Creek run in the fault? Uh, kind of, yeah. More or less. You gotta love it. How about a few more? 7.15. Time does slip away here when you're having fun. Fake May. Okay, so you're not a person. Good to know. Is the petrified wood available to take or is it on private property? Gary, it's, it's available. Um, it's public land. There's some basic rules about how much you can take. I, I, I don't really know that world. A few petrified wood guys from the Yakima Rock Club brought me up there a few years ago and um, it's just not my thing, but uh, there's petrified wood up there for sure. I don't know how the ice is formed in the caves. So I, I kind of told you what I knew and I, I don't know if anybody studied those caves scientifically. I've hit most of this. Why are there sand dunes at Beverly? Yeah, um, I think I know the answer. I've asked Carl Loquist a number of times over the years. I've, I seem to get different answers. Maybe I'm just not hearing correctly. But as I understand it generally, Justin, there's a lot of good looking sand dunes east of the Columbia River east of the Columbia River, Frenchman Cooley, east of the Columbia River at, ba at, at Beverly, east of the Columbia River at Potholes Reservoir. That's Columbia River sand. And we're confident it's Columbia River sand because when you look at the composition of the sand in those sand dunes, it's granite, feldspar and quartz. and It's not basaltic sand. So the general idea is before the dams were built, on the Columbia River, there was a lot of sand being carried by the Columbia River from north to south. And as soon as we put the dams in, we cut off the supply of that sand. So there's no more sand coming down the Columbia because of the dams that have been installed. And so those sand dunes that are east of the river are basically a remnant of when we used to have sand blowing uh, across the floodplain of the Columbia River. I'm doing this, which is kind of creepy, so we'll move on. Two more and we're done. Ever plan to do a live stream on Wenatchee Mountains? Well, I do have a request. I was encouraged enough last night that I do want to try. I don't think we'll do a field trip every night, but we'll do, we'll do at least one more. I need three bars minimum. So if you're a Verizon person, I guess even if you're not, uh, Email me, please, some suggestions on where I might be able to do a live stream that's got good coverage. As far as I can tell, you got to be close to the freeway or you're in tough luck. It's got to be reliable. I can't be out there, you know, oh, if you go out there on a Tuesday morning, maybe you'll have good coverage. I, no, I, I, mean, I got a lot of people tuning in. So it, it, was, it was about as shaky as I wanted to be at Frenchman. Uh, I need three bars minimum, four would be outstanding. And I'd also want to be away from the freeway noise and obviously need a spot that's good geologically. But if you've got some thoughts, yeah, maybe you wouldn't have to, would be a good spot. That's a good thought. One more. Nobody gives a poop. Thank you, Mark.
I'm looking for one more good one. Why are there wind gaps to the ridges thought to have housed the Columbia sometime in the past? Let, we'll finish with that. Thank you, Mark. I covered this briefly on a old Columbia, what was the ancient rivers of the Pacific Northwest. I really liked that one, even though people, they locked the doors at the library at seven o'clock. So everybody's banging on the side doors to get in. It was distracting for the first 20 minutes. Imagine, imagine me distracted by something. The question is about wind gaps. So there are places along the crest of some of these ridges, uh, most famously Sunnyside Gap. Let's just take that one. Sunnyside Gap is right here. And it's just like it sounds. The crest of the Rattlesnake Ridge is nice and strong, and then there's a little, a little dip. And there's a road that goes over it, and there's, you know, a little bit of one, a little bit of wind that funnels through there on occasion, but that's really not the story. The story is, though many of the wind gaps are places where the river used to cross. But the concept is, the river used to cross the ridge when the ridge was a baby. So here's, here's a, between these two fingers, let's have a river successfully crossing. So the river was there first, area's flat. The river's, the river's coming across and it's flat. Now we're starting to knuckle up. And if the uplift of my knuckle is slow, slow enough to allow the river to continue to carve, in other words, the river can match the uplift rate, then the river will just stay in its position and it will continue to cut and will eventually get a true gap like Sentinel Gap or, or, um, or Sela Gap or Union Gap. But wind gaps are truly wind gaps when the uplift rate is too fast for the river. And if this uplift, if, if this ridge is really knuckling up big time in a, in a short amount of time, it's really rising fast. At some point, the river says, screw this, I'm leaving. I can't, I can't keep flowing here. You're moving too fast. You're lifting too high. So I'm going to change my course of direction and go somewhere else. And perhaps that's the story here. I don't know if there's a wind gap. Um, where are we? We're on the firing range, I guess. Uh, but... It could be that this, up, this segment of the, uh, the Amtanum Ridge rose too fast and then Columbia, even the mighty Columbia said, I gotta, I gotta leave, I gotta go somewhere else. That's a good way to end, thank you. That's an interesting academic uh, discussion, I hope. Except Mark who says, uh, who cares? All right, a toast to you. Bubbly. Here's to you and your health. Oh, that tastes good. Here's to the health of your parents and your grandparents and your children and your grandchildren. Hang on, Patrick. Before I finish the toast, I will see you next on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time to talk about a trademark, a very important geologist by the name of George Otis Smith and Sunday morning at nine o'clock talking about Pacific Northwest tectonics. Here's to everyone in your world, in your community, the healthcare workers that continue to do amazing things. On and on and on. Here's to them and here's to you. Appreciate you joining us tonight. It's 7.20 p.m. That's plenty long. I'm signing off to you now from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Thanks for joining us. Have a good Friday. We'll see you Saturday morning. 
I love you. Goodbye. Okay. So we got 800 people. Let's see how many cake enthusiasts we have. I've got a plate. <sighs> Keith, thanks again. There's one lava, we'll do one. One lava cake, okay? So the directions say I should go inside and nuke this for 30 seconds. And that's what I'm gonna do. And then I'm come back out and we'll somehow get into this lava cake and see what happens together. And then I'll share the other three with my guests here. By guest, I mean my wife and her friend. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Well, I think I may be misunderstood. I thought maybe lava was going to come out inside of it, but it looks like it's like, I think it was like lava coming down the face. So you maybe already missed it. What should we do? Oh, you want to go inside of it? Cut it in half, says Matt. Hmm. Well, maybe I have a special treat for you to stick around. It's one of those New York lava cakes where you get the lava effect right out of the microwave. 
So I'm going to do one more. I'm going to give this one to my wife. I'm going to do another one. <laughs> and I'm going to try to run out here when it's truly doing its lava flow over the cake. And then we'll call it a night. Okay. <laughs> You guys wondered if he was out here. He's out here. So we're going to go uh, do one more lava cake, and uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to hustle out here and not fall face first into the lava cake. There's still 670 of you. Where are the other lava cakes? Josephine, I got one for you too. Oh boy. <laughs> With drill bits, please. <laughs> uh, oh, here we are. Here they are. All right, lava cake by Keith, take two. Actually, I get it now, I get it now. So here's what it looks like before it turns to lava. It's powdery, ash maybe, I don't know. Cougar point tough. And then here's kind of this frosting kind of thing. So when I nuke it, it all turns to lava and starts cascading. So I'll try to bring it out in record time. Oh, snow, my bad, my bad. No, that's, my, no, that's, that's me, Nick Zetner made a mistake. Lava's coming, lava's coming, lava's coming. Lava. 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 A lava cake. You gotta lava it. All right, I gotta start learning about George Otis Smith and shower in that order. This lava cake brought to you by Vinny's Bakery in downtown Ellensburg. You gotta love it. You gotta love you. You gotta love you. I love you and you gotta love you and it's just a bunch of loving. Thanks for joining us. I love you. Good night.